that that reaffirms their view that uh, they're growing in terms of uh, you know eco space and uh, controlling more of the online retail money. So that's interesting because we think of Kogan as a big retail or a big box store online, a bit like our answer to Amazon, maybe on a small scale though. But really, like you're saying, it's it's just expanded into all these other areas. Like it does have like. You know, you can get a SIM from Kogan, you can get insurance through yeah. Kogan. So it's not really like a pure retail play in the sense of it being like a, just a consumer stock. No, that's so, right. And energy and all that. And But they've also got their um, their own brands, their exclusive brands, which rose by some 35% on the latest uh, announcement. So, yeah, they're a really interesting story. They know what they can sell and what they can make good margins at. And what they can't, they're ultimately uh, branching out and getting best of breed to deliver it for them uh, in that uh, end objective of delivering a low cost option uh, for uh, retail consumers and that seems to be working. Is Kogan's performance then a good uh, gauge for consumer confidence? Like is is what's going on with Kogan actually a good indication of what we're looking at in the consumer sector in general? Because we have seen other reports come out this morning from Temple and Webstar saying it's very happy with its progress year to date and obviously that is a homewares business. But then yesterday we had Super Retail and saying yep. things aren't so good. Yeah, they came out. Well, they had 4.5% sales growth, but they were engaging in heavy discounting, which ate into margins. We had a downgrade then from Nick Scarley too a few weeks back, uh, but obviously that was in line with the property uh, uh, pulled back a few months ago, and they said that so far things have rebounded. And, yeah, obviously Australians remain employed, notwithstanding that they're not spending as much as what the government and others would be hoping for the very least they're still going out and buying things and when you look at all the retail announcements across the board what you're seeing is that change in behavior where more people are going online and when you've got bricks and mortar behind you that's nothing really but a drag at the minute uh, we saw vicinity centers actually one of the uh, property trusts gave an update uh, explaining the drag on um, retail outlets and what that's actually um, is doing for their margin given they hold a number of real estate assets. So I think it's just the change in the behaviours rather than necessarily sentiment as such. I think there's still a bit of a squeeze on consumers. I don't think that's going to change when I mean, we learn today that most likely our health premiums will be going up um, because uh, a lot they haven't been able to strike a deal uh, with regards to... Yeah, with a few of those technologies. So, yeah, it's um, I would be too early to say that uh, everything's uh, quite healthy, but definitely if you've got a niche product, the target's the right areas you're doing well. What's happening uh, with Red Bubble there? Uh, they've given an update. Yeah, really interesting little business. Uh, I know you're a big fan uh, there, Aaron, because when you make your tea cozies, you want someone that appreciates and is able to buy them. And what they I offer is an online market. Looking today, I might put a tea cozy on you. <laughs> No, <laughs> well, no, nothing like that. No, well, well, I cut my dreads off quite a while ago, so uh, it won't have the same impact as back in the old days. Um, but no, look, when it comes to uh, uh, this company, they're an online retailer for independent artists where effectively if you do make something quirky or unusual, you can put it up there and effectively have a marketplace to sell it all across the world. And this uh, delivered very strong result in this latest period. Um, revenue grew by um, some 43%. It's now sitting at 70 million. Just have a look at the numbers here. Uh, gross profit up by 48%. Uh, free cash flow is very strong. And when you look at analyst expectations, they're going to be profitable in the next period. So, um, you know, again, for a lot of those people out there in tech startup land, if you can find a niche market and target and you've got a product that allows you know, somewhere where it wasn't accessible before, you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, just the fact that it's a re- it's just using an online platform to sell things, yeah, yeah, but they've yeah. found an appropriate target market and they've done quite well. And their share price is up some 23% today to around $1.80 um, yeah. and it continues to attract the true believers because there's still some headroom to go, including for myself. Stop saying headroom. Um, in, terms <laughs> <We'll do. laughs> in terms of Kathmandu, uh, Trading halt for a capital raise there. Uh, you know what's going what's going on with Kathmandu? Yeah, look, what happened there was they they well they bought Rip Curl, we know that, and they had a capital raising with institutions which went re- yeah which went really well. Uh, but then came the retail element, and they've been able to raise around fifty nine percent of the allocation from retail investors. So 
the companies had to go into a trading hold so that it can go and tap its other institutional investors to cover off on the shortfall. So um, a little bit uh, unusual, not uh, usual to see that sort of thing. I would have thought, I mean, we don't hold Kathmandu, but I would have thought that investors would have viewed this uh, quite positively, uh, an iconic brand at what appeared to be a reasonable valuation, but be it inertia or, or something, I can't really explain what it is, they weren't able to to raise those funds. So they'll be uh, tapping their uh, backers in regards to uh, covering off on the uh, uh, the book build and the shortfall and uh, and then they'll continue on their trajectory. So watch this space possibly. There might be that's, a little bit more afoot. That's interesting in itself because like you said, you would have thought maybe people would be a little bit more excited about this, but maybe it's in line with that, that shift away to, you know, we're going more online and there's, it might yeah. be more of a structural shift rather than like a, a cyclical issue we're seeing right now where people are actually moving to online and Kathmandu doesn't have a very strong online presence potentially compared no, very to other retailers. True. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, look, Laura, any brand name that I'm familiar with probably tells you that, you know, it's already probably 20 years too late <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, who knows whether that brand, you know, is ab absolutely has the same pull and drag as it did in the Telsian days. So um, there could be a myriad of different reasons and, yeah, it could reaffirm that view. Sounds like uh, Kathmandu has quite the mountain to climb. Ah, uh, uh, very good, Aaron. Delivering a tough outlook. Sorry, what was that? Do people not want fruit and veggies anymore? What's going on with Costa Group? Ah, uh, yeah, no, Costa Group. Yeah, well, look, this is tough. Um, Costa Group's gone into a trading hole. Yesterday, there was rumours that a big downgrade's going to be coming. They've gone quite aggressive in regards to their debt acquisition plan.